broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here once again with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! Yeah. I'm here. Woo! <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's nice to get this this thing back together, right? Like, what a long, strange trip this has been. Huh? Right. Well, it's nice <laughs> to be back I, I, and feel like in, we're in some kind of routine. Like, yeah, I like it. We're getting there. Hopefully, we're we're back to normal and more or less back to normal. I'll, you know, real life gets in the way from time to time, but yeah. And we're gonna have some of that, but um, yeah, it, it feels like the world's getting back to normal too. At least my part of the world. I don't know how you feel, but yeah, I mean, I spent more time in the office this week than I have in a couple of months, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so uh, even with the holiday and everything, um, so yeah, I, I think so. Uh, we've been we've been going out to dinner. Yeah, I was gonna say we've been able to go out like yeah. that's something that hadn't happened in forever. Yeah, know? so uh, you know we said that after we recorded um, the a couple of days ago that we were going out to dinner, and we did, and we followed through. Yep. So um, we were able to get a seat. It was really easy. There was no one there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's been my experience since all this started. Is like like places are like that at least are empty. Yeah, um, it's the, unfortunate. The beaches are insane. Um, I saw some numbers from some groups this week from Gulf Shores this weekend that uh, they had more people on the beach this weekend than they did during Fourth of July last year. Oh, really? Yeah, like it okay. was it was crazy. And the numbers I saw from some of the businesses reflected that. Like, I mean, it's they had some banner week weekend. So, all right, good. Well, I just got to um, indulge in the best part of having you back which is that I was able to take a drink without pausing the podcast. Uh, <laughs> Helps keep the flow good. Yeah. What you drinking over over there, Mike? Um, I was I also went to the liquor store today. Nice. Um, I bought as much as I could. That that's not really true. I could have bought plenty more, but I was going to um, say they didn't restrict you, did they? <laughs> no, no. Um, but I did well they do have an interesting system at the they've shut down some of the ABCs around here. Yeah. Um, and directed you to other places. Uh, so one of the bottles that I bought, I mean, they sent me down to the specialty shop, which is where I actually do a lot of liquor store shopping anyway. Best because, place to go, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they have things that you can't get elsewhere. And I got a bottle of uh, Armagnac down there that I can't get anywhere else in the county anyway. So, it was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. But um, they let people in three at a time. You stand on your little number on the floor, and uh, you have your, your special shopper. <laughs> that works Ooh, at the ABC. Special shopper. Yeah, that works at the you know one of the ABC store employees that you tell them what you want and they go they go around and get it and then they bring it up to the register and you you check out. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of weird. You have to know exactly what you want. There's no there's no browsing. Yeah, which kind of sucks. That's a problem for me because I usually don't know what I want when I go in anyway. Yeah, like I'm. I want to kind of see what's available and then make my pick from that. Well, and I asked for a particular scotch that they didn't have in stock. Yeah. Um, and they said, would you like something else instead? And I said, well, yeah, probably, but I, I would have to, I'd have to peruse a little to <laughs> figure that out. And I can't, I can't see <laughs> what you've got over there in that corner. I'm telling you, next <laughs> time you go up there, take your binoculars with you. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, just bringing my glasses in with me would have probably, would probably helped. do more than anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause you know, my vision is like, like I can see just fine up close. I don't need them to read or anything like that. I need them to drive and like see things that are far away see, from me. I if I go to the movie theaters, I got to bring my glasses in because it's too far away for me to focus on the, yeah. on the picture. I have the same problem. I, I can't see far away well. Yeah. So. But you have to wear your glasses all the time. I do have to wear mine all because I'm basically blind without them, but not for <laughs> stuff up close. It's oh, okay. for distance. Right. Fair <laughs> enough. And I like to be able to see distance. It's important, man. Yes, I I remember, like, I knew that my vision was starting to go for a little while before I finally broke down and, and went and got my eyes checked and got glasses. And I remember <laughs> I remember the first time I wore my glasses when I was driving after that. And I was like, wow, <laughs> did, did everybody know that trees aren't just big green blobs? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, there's actual individual little bits that make up those green blobs. Right. I, Trees have leaves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, and I'm starting to get back that way. I probably need to go back and see the eye doctor again. You yeah. know, every every few years, they've got to increase my prescription like a half of whatever the measurement is. 
it's been almost five years since I've been to see an eye doctor. Yeah. And I need to bad. Like <laughs> I, my vision, I, sh I'm, I can tell like it's way worse than it should be. Yeah. And it's like bad without, it's really bad without the glasses. Mm -hmm. Like I about can't see. I can still read signs on the road. I figure as long as I can still read the signs, I'm doing okay. Yeah. And why spend all that money to get? Question is, can you read the license plates? Not that you need to, but could you? <laughs> Uh, it depends. <laughs> depends on how close you are, yeah, right? <laughs> it does. Well, let's let's get into things. We we yeah, managed we to will. somehow waste five minutes, um, but uh, you know we haven't been able to like uh, when we went out last not this week but last week. That was the first time we'd seen each other in two months. Oh yeah, yeah. Like we were, you were taking the social distance serious. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was trying. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data at that point. That's true. Better safe than sorry, and. Um, and, um, you know, I, there was a while that I was worried for myself because they managed to make me thoroughly paranoid, even though, even though I was sitting here on the, I mean, you listened, I was sitting oh, yeah. here on this podcast, like speaking out against it, like yeah. about how the data wasn't suggestive of what they were having us do and how, um, it was way overblown and so forth. And like, I, while I knew that intellectually, it was, it's a different Hard thing to... when you have to act on those. Like, yeah. Because like, so through that whole deal, I was working at my store like I always do. Nothing really changed there. And um, like I was telling you earlier, like I was weird about touching stuff. Like, I mean, and that's basically what I do all day is touch stuff to mm -hmm. fix it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was constantly weirded out by it. But I, I finally just made the decision in my head that's like, look, I get it, I get it, if, but I'm not going to like not touch things and not go through my normal routine because of it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But. I was more, more concerned for my parents. I mean, it wasn't just a couple of weeks in, it was more concerned for my parents than myself. Oh, I get that. Um, you know, my parents are in their seventies and, oh, uh, so it was, uh, I, like, I can't imagine how bad I would feel if I brought that into their home. You know? That's true. No, I absolutely understand that. But truth is, I didn't see them very much during that time period either. <laughs> I was like, gonna say, yeah, because yeah. I remember talking to you. Yeah, you were yeah. pretty well. You were pretty well here at the at the undisclosed location. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I spent I spent a lot of time here. So. That's why I was talking about <laughs> stupid video games on half the podcast. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> that's much what you else were to doing. Do. <laughs> um, well, uh, I mean, we've got a, a bunch of things to go over, and um, and for those that are interested, because we've had some questions, like we will talk about the General Flynn deal, yeah, but not today. Um, that deserves more time than than we're willing to give it. Like we've just got too many other things that we want to hit. We're trying to catch up. Yeah, there's and I I didn't read them because I was at work, but I, there was some updates I saw on some of that today. Like there was stuff that was still coming out today. Yeah. So I mean, I do think we need to actually spend some time on that more so than what we're going to really have today. Okay. Well, there was something that you wanted to address the the immediate current oh, yeah. events. So. so like right now in Minneapolis, there's there's still riots going on now, mm -hmm. um, for where they um. I mean, for anybody that don't know, which I don't know how you couldn't, like, there, I guess they, what was the guy's name? I had it written. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, there was a, a something officer. Something Bruce, Bruce something. No, it wasn't know. Bruce. Um, right. It was George something. Um, it's on my phone somewhere. But okay. yeah, um, an officer, like, literally killed this guy by kneeling on his neck, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's been riots going on um, since, I guess, basically since the day before yesterday, maybe. Yeah. Um, and I have mixed feelings about this. Like I'm all for like people being in the streets because this is a big deal. Like this, mm -hmm. to me, there's not much of a bigger deal than this. Like this is, there's, this is absolutely reason for people to be in the streets. I just don't think they should be attacking businesses. Yeah. They should be attacking government buildings. Yeah. Like this is my position. Like I mean, I am all we for We do not them. advocate attacking government buildings. <laughs> Mike does not advocate attacking <laughs> government buildings. I on the other hand, which I I heard today that um I guess a group I guess got through and attacked um one of the police stations and like was in the process of burning a police station down. Mm -hmm. And like as soon as I saw that I was like, "Yes, it's happening." Like like yeah. this is what needs to be happening like yeah. like take your frustration out where it's where it needs to be taken out well I, I have some different feelings than that about it really I um, first off uh, there certainly were problems with how it was handled like the the police department immediately lied about it and then the video came out 
and then they had to change their story. Yeah. Um, That's on the other common, hand, actually. Well, yeah. I mean, you know. Um, but on the other hand, they did fire the four uh, policemen officers involved like immediately. And that's um, a good start. Yeah, a- absolutely. So it's not like, I mean, I, I get, it seems to me that people are out there rioting because they feel like the uh, police department wasn't taking act. They weren't getting justice quickly enough or something like that. Yeah. Um, but the truth is that this police department was acting more quickly than most do. It's true. No, I, I, I don't think you're wrong about that. And they're, you know, there may have been, uh, they were already pressing tr- murder charges against one of the guy, the guy, I guess, uh, presumably the, guy, the guy that was actually kneeling on his neck. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't happen very often. No. Um, and that's true. I mean, I'm, I would agree with you on all of those points. The problem, the problem I have is this keeps happening. Like it's not, to me, it just, it doesn't feel like this is an isolated incident. And and it may be more of a fundamental problem of just having the government run your police for you. Um, well, I think the, I think that's a small part of the problem. Yeah. Um, I think the problem is that is something that we've mentioned here on this podcast before is that government manages all levels of law enforcement. Yeah. They, it, it's government that controls the creation of laws, the interpretation of laws, and the enforcement of laws. If any one of those things was handled by a private entity, if you just took the judicial part out of the out of government hands and put it into private arbitration or something like that, that would go a long way towards actually um, creating some accountability. Yeah. Because the way it sits now is that all of those three levels defend each other. Yeah. And back each other up and lie for each other. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, and part of it is, well, I mean, it's this, you know, okay. So if I can go down, um, a little tangent for a minute, Let's do um, it. I was, <laughs> I was watching, uh, I was watching a stream the other day while I was at the office. So I had a stream, uh, a stream on, on one of my monitors while I was doing work on the other. Um, and I say I was watching, I wasn't really watching, I was listening, but, uh, what I heard (laughs) made me turn my attention to it because there's this Australian guy and he says, um, that, uh, he, uh, he was talking about the response to the coronavirus stuff and, um, you know, the various mandates about masks and social distancing and so forth. And he said, he said, well, it just seems like, um, you know, the countries that don't put as much emphasis on civil liberties uh, can manage this better. <laughs> yeah, I've heard this argument before myself. And I, like, I was like, are you, are you seriously complaining about living in a country that values civil liberties? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> because I, I promise the alternative isn't better. Yeah, you're in Australia. China's not far away. Go ahead. Yeah, go give that a try. See how that works <laughs> yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I just, uh, I, I, he said, well, yeah, I mean, to, a to a point, um, he, and I think that he was actually, he, he was talking about the tracking. Well, uh, we yeah. should talk about the tracing apps. We can, we can spin this back around to the, to the thing in Minnesota, can, because I think this is kind of an important issue. I wish I brought my phone in here. Um, a guy in my office sent me, uh, something yesterday, um, about the uh, HR six 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 six. That's the trace. Oh, um, the thing. tracing the legislation or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um. And he sent me the original title of it with a bunch of questions in it. Oh um, yeah. Because the original title was much longer. Um. And it included you know all it, it was like uh, um you know to uh, uh, isolate people you know read house arrest. Um, and, uh, for the COVID-19 and other issues, which it wasn't Ooh. specific about what the other issues were. See, and, <laughs> and that's all to come later because yeah. this is all groundwork for what's next. And I don't know what's next, but mm-hmm. I'm just telling you there will be something next. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly it. And, uh, um, he, you know, there's a lot of people that are on board with the tracing apps and, the argument that I hear, including from this Australian guy the other day, y- yesterday maybe, um, is, uh, well, you're already being tracked. You know, Google and Facebook and all these companies are already tracking you. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, to some degree you can opt out. Like, 
Yeah. Even if you can't click a button to opt out, you can stop using those things. Well, that's, and I think that's really the point is, um, which I'm not okay with those companies tracking us either, no, by the way. Neither. But at the same time, you make a good point. I don't have to use those services if I don't want to. Right. I'm going to assume that whatever this new tracking deal is, we're not going to have an opt out for that. Yeah. Well, like, right we now, it's required. Right now, m- countries that have, inst- most countries that have instituted it, countries that yeah. value civil liberties that have instituted it. <laughs> yeah. Um, have made it optional. Yeah. Um, but uh, he he was saying, you know, you're already being tracked by, the, you know, these other companies, and I don't have any problem with my government tracking me in that way. And, uh, you know, oh, because, <laughs> because then, he, of course, he made the argument. He says, uh, um, well, you know, the uh, if you're not doing anything wrong, yeah, what do you have to worry about? And somebody else in the chat was like, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like that is the yeah. most like, yeah. Um, basic and worst argument for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause look at what we do right here or just, just our membership in the libertarian party. We're in an outside party that is that part of its goal is to t- take apart at least some aspects of government to yeah. reduce the power and size and scope of government. Well, you don't think that that might be Imagine considered the threatening? the government <laughs> isn't really going to take too kindly to that. Yeah. And, and, and it, you don't even have to be as extreme as that. Like, yeah. I mean, even like just Democrats being in power and having that power over Republicans. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, they've already exercised some yeah. of this stuff and, with the Flynn thing. Yeah. And, that, and that's, all, that's what it comes down to, I think, in the end. Um, he said, well, you know, I know a lot of people don't trust their government, and, and I guess I get that, but I, I trust my government. And I, I, said, I mean, this is all well, chat, so I can't exactly interact <laughs> with him, but yeah. um, I mean, I could have, but I, I wasn't going to type a paragraph. Thing, and like, yeah. um, but I was thinking, okay, you trust your government. Yeah. What about the next one? Yeah. Or the one after that? Yeah. How do you know that you're going to trust them? Well, and, and as far as us here in this country, I don't trust this government at all. Oh, yeah. Me, no, mean, me this, neither. This is one of the most corrupt governments there is, as far as I'm concerned. Well, and if you just look at, I, I mean, I don't keep a whole lot of track of what's going on in, in Australia, but I keep track of international affairs enough to know just based on the information that the Australian government was releasing last year during the wildfires that I don't trust that government. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, and... Uh, and I can see your response of, well, you know, there's protections in place to prevent that kind of abuse. Yeah. But what you're talking about in allowing um, the government to start tracking your every move and uh, and ignore civil liberties issues to get some things done like that, you're like advocating the erosion of those exact protections. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean... It's it's yeah. that that's what protects you is their inability to just do this thing. And now you're saying, well, let them go ahead and do it because there's protections in place. Well, not when they're done. Exactly. exactly. It's it's scary, man. What's scary the most to me is that there are people out there that and there's a lot of them that think that way mm-hmm. and that that think that this is that that's a OK state of mind to be in. And I, I don't know. I mean, that's that's what we're up against. Yeah. Well, and. I've said with this podcast, one of my goals is to get on the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center's list of anti-government extremists. <laughs> Certainly gets me on some list. Yeah. I mean, I, I um, the guy that sent me the the thing uh, about the title of the HR six 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 six. Yeah. Um, he's a uh, he's a former ranger. He's a good guy. He's a, um, a very devout Christian. Like. He, I mean, I, cu- I couldn't pick out something wrong about him, ex- really. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's done bad things or or does bad things from time to time, but nothing extreme, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, I certainly wouldn't worry he's about... He's not like a bad person. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of the best people I know, I think. I mean, yeah. you know, from what I know of him. Yeah. Um, and so what sparked that whole thing is I went in and I asked him, and I, I said, um, you know, you're not somebody who breaks the law or, or does bad things uh, as much as you can help it, at least. I mean, I'm, you know, yeah. accidental bad things are Everything accidental, happens, right? Yeah. But um, I said, uh, so that being the case, uh, how do you feel about your government tracking your every move? He's like, absolutely not. Yeah, <laughs> I would yeah it's never not okay. Allow that. Yeah, it's not um, okay. And I said, well, you're not doing anything wrong. Why wouldn't you do that? He's like, who would trust anyone with that kind of information and power? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> Um, 
I, I yeah, I don't get it. And so, but this is kind of what's happened in law enforcement, right? Is that they they've increasingly been given power to um, the police state kind of power. They've turned from peace officers to law enforcement officers. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Like, because that's really what they should be there to do. Is mm-hmm. to, I mean, I think of like the old days with like. Like officer nice or whatever, you know. Officer friendly. Officer friendly. That's what yeah. I couldn't pull it. Yeah, yeah. Like officer friendly, and that's that's what the cops should be. You know, I mean, that's it. it but they're far from that now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, and just just like the instances of like no knock raids and stuff like that. Like to yeah. me, there's never an excuse to execute a no knock raid. I and, agree. And they do more and more every year. Yeah. Well. Um, was it uh, Radley Valco? Is that that guy's name? It's something Maybe. like that. He was supposed to speak at one of our conventions. A oh yeah, years yeah, ago. yeah, yeah. Um, he uh, his estimate is that there's something like fifty thousand SWAT raids a year in the U.S. Yeah, that's a thousand every week. That's in, there's and there's no SWAT raids. There's no cause for that, and most of them are for drugs. And mm. like, who cares? Like, I mean, it's it's not like they're going in looking for like child molesters or something. Like, I might almost get on board with that. <laughs> yeah, well, I still couldn't. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I have a real problem the day, with the no knock raid. Well, me um, too. And mostly because it, cre- it it creates a dangerous situation. Yeah. Just in and of itself, because whether you've got a good warrant or not. Um, if you bang down my door in the middle of the night, you're likely to get shot at, which means oh. I'm likely to get killed. Well, I mean, look into, I mean, for the listeners, and I've read a little bit about this guy, but the incident with Duncan Limp um, was the same type thing. And like I said, I haven't read enough to really speak on that specific incident. But if you're interested, it's something to look into because that's kind of what happened there. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. people break into your home. And you don't know any different. Like yeah. you, I mean, you don't know if you're if these are robbers or if they're police. Yeah. If they yell police, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're police. Yeah. I mean, that would be the first thing I would do as a robber is yell yeah. police. Yeah. Like, right? I mean, not saying I'd rob somebody, but mm-hmm. like common sense tells you, you know. Yeah. So. You create that hesitation, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. Uh, they they've certainly uh, overstepped their authority in this case. Um, th- at the point that you lean on somebody's neck long enough with them yelling that they can't breathe, because yeah. this can actually happen really fast too. Like if you, if you actually like really occlude blood throat, blood flow to the brain, um, you're out and in like 12 seconds or something like that. It there's, takes there's almost no time. And but they're training ought to tell them that. Like, yeah. I mean, there should be, I mean, I don't know anything. I've never been trained as a police officer, so I mm-hmm. don't know. But I'm just saying, like, that should be a no-brainer. Like, yeah. Well, the thing that seems apparent to me from what I saw of this is that, at you know, by the time the guy had died, and well before it, frankly, yeah. um, he wasn't a threat. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the point. Like, I mean, even if all he had to do was give the guy some slack, like, I mean, because he wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. Like, there they, were three other guys on Yeah. They had him. Like, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I was saying, uh, to a guy at work that there's, you know, there's, um, actually this is what I got off on, on, and on him is, uh, besides the whole, you know, the drug war and the various ways that, um, police can do proactive policing now, which I, creates which a lot is, of antagonistic well, and it, it interactions. Well, a lot of the problems that you mm-hmm. have. Like, yeah. I mean, you remove the drug war from all of this and just legalize everything, mm-hmm. a lot of these problems go away just like that. I'm yeah. not saying things are perfect afterwards, but you're on the road. Yeah. You know. uh, well, because you can go looking for a crime as it is. They, yeah. And, and it's, uh, there is a... Um, an economic incentive to police departments to do that because then they can seize your car, your house and so forth. Like that's a problem in and of itself. Yeah. Um, I can't think of the term for the asset as, civil, forfeiture, civil asset forfeiture. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is ridiculous. It's like a way it, it essentially gives the police the uh, ability to steal. Yeah. It, it like, here's your legal right to steal. That's, pretty much what that does. But um, beyond that is that we have, like in the last, really, I guess in the last 50 years or so, uh, we've completely given up on the old common law practice, which was a part of our law at the beginning. I mean, most of our 
our law came from the old English common law practices. Um, and in the last 50 years, through uh, various forms of judicial activism, they have essentially removed the idea of the right to resist, um, the right to resist unlawful arrest. Yeah. And um, there was a time in this country where if uh, they didn't have a good reason, like a real legitimate, like, you know, served warrant reason to arrest you that you didn't have to go yeah. and you could uh, do anything in your power up to and including lethal force to prevent an unlawful arrest. Yeah. And so could bystanders. Yeah. So if um, you saw something going on, you yeah. could step in. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that has been completely removed through various forms of judicial activism that you, yeah. you are now required to you are forced to comply. Yeah. Yeah. You're now required to comply. There's no yeah. more, Right to resist. Yeah, whether anymore. they're right or wrong. And even the mm -hmm. attorneys will tell you, like, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Yeah. Like, you have to comply. Fight it in court. Yeah. And guess what? Get ready to lose. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing is, like, how much of your freedom do you lose in the meantime? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're probably looking at, at weeks at least and probably months of freedom if you're actually just going to fight it in court. Yep. And whatever money you have to put down if you uh, if you make bail. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's the other end of it, you know. And there have been cases of people spending years in prison and dying in prison that never saw a court. Yeah. They, yeah. And they were never because, tried because for anything. The other thing is um, the right to a speedy trial is a joke. Like, oh, yeah. You can't get a speedy trial. And it's amazing that that's the case because something like 98% of cases are, are resolved through plea deals. How is it that they only actually try 2% of cases and they still can't keep and up? And still can't keep up with the backlog. It's crazy. Yeah. So, uh, um, well, I, I think it doesn't exactly lead us to, but, um, I think it's worth talking about now, um, in terms of right to resist, yeah. uh, is the Stefan Ar or not Stefan, um, Am Ahmed, Ahmed Arbery. Maybe. I don't uh, know. it's a case in Georgia. Um, the guy appears to may have been a jogger. Uh, who had stopped in a house that was under construction. Oh, yeah, um, yes, okay. And then he's like, when he's jogging down the street, a couple of guys from the neighborhood uh, cut him off in their pickup truck and threatened him with guns. And the story is that they were trying to do a, 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 a stop Citiz and a citizen's arrest because they suspected he was responsible for um, some robberies that were in the area. Yeah. Uh, and as more information has come out, it's turned out that that is... A complete yeah. bull. I mean, like yeah. the whole thing is ridiculous. And there's a podcast that I listen to. It's the the Beauty and the Beta podcast, um, which I enjoy. They do mostly news. Um, they're certainly more right wing podcast, but they're entertaining and they cover some stuff that isn't being covered elsewhere. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but they're usually pretty good on this kind of thing. And they've been terrible on this one. Well, not really? terrible, but uh, disappointing anyway yeah. um, on this one. That there's even any question that this was legitimate for these uh, these guys that stopped this other guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems to me very clear. You know, it seems to me very queer, clear that there is no question uh, who initiated force in this case. Yeah. Um, if you were jogging down the street and somebody cut you off in a truck and was, was brandishing a shotgun, <laughs> we're fixing to have a gunfight. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't <laughs> like, see any problem with that guy either attacking the person with the shotgun or trying to re wrestle the shotgun away from him. Yeah. I think that that is perfectly reasonable under the circumstances because he's been threatened first. Absolutely. Um, and the whole idea of a citizen's arrest is uh, like, you have to have witnessed the crime. Yeah. Um, which they didn't. They just suspected that this guy, you know, like, and uh, apparently one of the um, one of the attackers, I'll say, um, had been um, with the local sheriff's department or some law enforcement agency until fairly recently, and so they keep passing this case away because everybody knows him and nobody wants to take the take the take trial. It on, yeah. um, I think it's been moved to Cobb County now from. Uh, it was, uh, I think it started in Buford, Georgia. So having lived there, it's been a while, but I would say that's probably 200 miles away, oh, wow. um, that they've moved this case because it keeps getting transferred, uh, you know, the, away. yeah. Um, either the, the district attorney or the judge keeps stepping a, uh, away from it anyway. Yeah. Um, but I would say that it is it, in terms of right to resist that, uh, Ahmad Arbery had every right to resist them trying to stop him 
um, and had every right to use lethal force to to do that. Unfortunately, he ended up in the wrong end. He was the guy that was killed. Yeah. Um, but the that there's even any kind of question about who's responsible for this and whether this is murder or not, I think is silly. Yeah. It is a very clear case of murder to yeah. me. I mean, uh, no question in my mind, at least from what I've seen. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy, man. Like, I just, I don't. And there's so much of this going on, which is why I say, like I, like I did, like, I mean, I, I get why people are in the streets. And I'm, I, like I say, I support it. Mm-hmm. I just wish they would focus their energy better. On the, on the problem, yeah. yeah. I mean, because that, um, that's what gets me. I mean, and I don't, like I say, it just, it doesn't solve anything to attack the target in the auto zone. Like, I mean, it, it, it yeah. just doesn't. Like, yeah. I mean, and I, I get that those are, because I've heard the argument be put that these are big corporations and big businesses and they need to step up and, and say something. And I just, I, I just don't see it that way. The only thing I see happening is them leaving those communities. Yeah. Well, I think their only responsibility is to make products available to those communities. It's not their job to be activists. Yeah, and it's, it's not. It's the government. In fact, there's very little that irritates me more than an activist corporation. Yeah. Well, yeah, no <laughs> joke. I didn't even think about it from that perspective. But you're right. Like, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, yeah. like, sell me my product and keep your politics out of it. Um, speaking of politics, uh, moving, as we segue, <laughs> moving away from this, um, just like a couple of, uh, of quick hits, I think. Um, and then we'll move into something we can spend a little bit more time with. Um, I, I would say that, a, a lot of this, actually let's start somewhere else. Um, so our new issue, just to do some quick foreign policy stuff, uh-huh. um, you know, we had the attempted coup in Venezuela a couple of weeks ago, which we may or may not have been involved with. But there were two former U.S. special ops guys that were running the thing. So, you know, take from that what you will. Exactly. <laughs> um, our new the new great outrage um, that gets both of our most hated countries um, involved is that Iran is trading oil with Venezuela. Ooh. Yeah. Um, since both of these countries are under the, the strictest, uh, economic sanctions that we have for anybody in the world right now, we're, we're literally trying to starve the people to death. Yeah. Um, in both th- of these countries. Yeah. I, I think that it's perfectly I, like, I'm perfectly content with them engaging in voluntary trade between each other. Well, and who the hell gives us the right to step in there and tell them they can't. Right. I mean, that's kind of where, I mean, mm-hmm. that's where I stand with it. I mean, I'm not fans of any, I'm, I don't really care one way or the other, but it just seems crazy that we would step in and be like, oh, wait, y'all are both under sanctions, so y'all can't trade. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, what more, what is it that, that you used to call when you surrounded the castle, a siege? Yeah. Like, that's, uh, is this that is what the modern day siege. This yeah. is a modern day siege. That's mm-hmm. all this is. Yeah. Um, and the goal is the same, is to starve the people out. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And and I'm sorry, I can't be on the side of that. Yeah, it's a terrible thing. Um, it, it is one of the worst humanitarian attacks that can be launched, I think, at this point uh, in the world is the yeah. is the blockade, the trade blockade. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that it does, it doesn't help us in the long run anyway, because all we've done is made both of these countries, particularly Iran, um, more reliant on uh, Russia and China. Yeah, which is... Is a scary proposition in itself. I yeah. mean, because that when you mentioned that, that's exactly what I what, what I was thinking is. Well, I wonder where China and Russia stand on this because oh, I, they're happy to trade. I bet they are. Yeah. Um. Of course, you know, there's some drawbacks to that because that's that might be a big part of the reason that Iran had such a terrible outbreak of the coronavirus. Well, um, is because <laughs> yeah, the, almost true. all of their trade is with China at this point. Yeah. Um. Now, another part of it, though, is that while we claim that we're not blockading any uh, any medical um, supplies, uh, yeah, supplies, uh, we are. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I think even if even if we weren't intentionally that, just by the idea of having a blockade up, yeah, is gonna it scares is, people away. Well, exactly, but mm-hmm. not as much we'll get in as should. Yeah. Um, and speaking of China, uh, we have now decided this week after, um, a security, uh, resolution as I understand it. Now I could be wrong about this. Um, in Hong Kong, um, we have decided that Hong Kong is no longer an autonomous, uh, city and that it shouldn't be given the privileges of being separate from, um, 
the People's Republic of China in terms of uh, trade with the U.S. It's it was given special privileges um, because of its special status, and now we're saying that that special status no longer exists. And um, it's our job to enforce that uh, the contract between um, the U.K. and China um, be executed properly. Now, well, why that one's our problem? Again, I no. don't know. Well, what um, do we are think? using the UN. It is a UN backed. Um, agreement yeah. between the UK and China. What but, do you think has changed our position on that? Uh, just this uh, announcement of the security resolution <laughs> that they're going to allow um, Chinese intelligence uh, to have um, a presence within the city of Hong Kong. Yeah, but why Why have we decided that that's a... Uh... Oh, um, I mean, I'm not entirely sure. Just to keep pressure up on China, I think, is the Maybe. big thing. I mean... Yeah. Um, where there are plenty of factions within the U S government and military establishment that are itching for a war with China. Yeah. Why that is, is completely beyond my understanding. Yeah. Um, well, it's job security is what it is. I mean, <laughs> as much as anything else, it, it's money for some and job security for others. That's, that's what it's about. But, uh, it's certainly not in our interest, like the no. people of the United States. Last um, thing we want, I mean, last thing we want is a war with anybody, but particularly with China. Yeah. Like, yeah, we don't want a war with Iran. We damn sure don't want a war with China. Hell no. <laughs> um, and we don't want a war with Russia either, but there are people that are itching for that one That's too. True. That's um, true. So I, I don't know. I, I think that it's really just to keep, you know, to maintain this idea that China's the bad guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it goes along with the coronavirus claims uh, as well. Um, and so I, that's, that's my best guess. Yeah. Um, and on, I mean, I guess moving to the coronavirus, we may as well do some updates there. It keeps coming yeah. up kind of no matter what we're talking about anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, everything seems to revolve around that right now. So this, I, I want to start with uh, just a couple of, you know, pieces of, of interest, I think. Now, um, one is that I have been saying this whole time that any kind of pronouncements that are made about the nature of the virus, um, infection rates, fatality rates, uh, transmission vectors, et cetera, et cetera, um, are best guesses at yeah. this point. Uh, there has not been enough time um, for any thorough studies, replicable studies to be done to determine the truth of any of this. And yeah. it's the same thing with the treatments, right? So I, I talked, uh, you know, last the last podcast I did alone, I talked about the difference between um, hydroxychloroquine, the hydroxychloroquine zinc thing and um, remdesivir. And said that, you know, they dismissed one of them, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, because they said that there hadn't been any studies, you know, uh, peer reviewed studies that could support the effects of it. Um, and then they started promoting remdesivir when the Which same was, was the in truth. the same boat. Yeah, yeah, the same was true of that. Um, and, I, and actually, I guess as long as we're talking about those two things, uh, the study that they keep talking about with the hydroxychloroquine um, took patients that were already. Uh, in bad shape and said that they, you know, that they all died or, you know, most of them died or whatever, the people that were already on a ventilator. Well, it's very clear from the, um, it, it seems very clear from the medical stuff that uh, hydroxychloroquine is effective when taken early or when taken as a prophylactic. Yeah. By the and time that you're symptom. in such a bad shape, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, and But that's the study that they keep touting to tell you how terrible it is and how yeah. it'll it'll kill you. Well, which is right. why Trump's taking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and the but the main thing is that it uh, it costs tens of cents a day for treatment with hydroxychloroquine, and it costs hundreds of dollars a day for treatment with um, remdesivir. And by the way, the study that they keep talking about with remdesivir that says that it it showed. Uh, that people recovered on average four days faster or something, four or five days, I can't remember, mm -hmm. um, from the virus. Uh, it also showed that it didn't have any impact on mortality. Really? <laughs> the, it was the same uh, percentage of people that died from the virus as uh, if they weren't taking it. So wow. um, it doesn't, it, I mean, if the one thing kills you, so does the other. Uh, <laughs> but if you recover, you recover faster. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. there you go. Um, but I think that this is mostly a money thing. Yeah. Um, here's the other bit. Uh, and if you stop and think about it for a minute, you'll, you'll realize it. But um, they keep going on about how well, we're working towards a, um, 
a vaccine. Well, we'll get this vaccine and that'll fix all our problems. Yeah. But we've had this for a season. Uh, we actually do not know at this point whether um, recovering from the virus and getting antibodies in your system uh, provides long-term immunity. Yeah, that's... It is the same class of virus that causes the common cold. You do not get long-term immunity from getting the common cold. You can get it again the next season. In fact, you can get it twice in the same season. Like You I've can catch that. it at the beginning of the season and catch it again at the end of the season. Yeah. Um, so the, the fact of the matter is, and like I said, if you stop and think about it, you'll realize that if you do not get long-term immunity from the development of antibodies, a vaccine does nothing. Yeah, well, you'd have to keep changing it, right? Well, no, you just have to keep doing it. Yeah. Like it would be, um, it would be, I guess, similar to the flu vaccine, except the flu vaccine, they actually give you different strains of flu, the flu you to, know, to facilitate um, the antibodies. but it would be something that you would have to take every year and it may or may not be effective. Yeah. Um, and, but that's what they want. That's what they love about the flu vaccine. And that's kind of what they want with this too, because if you're taking it every year, that's a whole lot of money. And, uh, of course, uh, vaccine producers are protected from any liability of, uh, from any issues that result. Um, yeah. they're indemnified, well, uh, that's what's legally me. indemnified from any problems that result. That's what scares me is the idea that I could, that they could give this to a massive amount of the population like without any real testing or whatever, and that like people end up dying and sick mm -hmm. from something. And, and that's part of the reason I won't be taking it regardless. Like I'll yeah. take my chances. I'm not as worried about that. There have been, we ought to spend some time on this uh, sometime in the future. There have been a lot of discussions about the constitutionality of forcing people to take vaccines. That's what I'm worried about um, um, because there, there has been a big push towards that. Um, and I'm, like I say, not on board myself. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Um, but for some reason, uh, this is my chance to tear down Cuomo a little bit because I don't like the guy anyway. Yeah. But um, he's being held up as some kind of hero in this, uh, <laughs> which as uh, I heard Dave Smith say, um, I don't know why you would hold this guy up as the hero since he's over the city that has had the worst coronavirus <laughs> right? impact. But, um, <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> anyway, uh, a lot of people don't know this because they, they don't seem to be talking about it because they're trying to make this guy into a hero. I mean, I, I think they're setting him up for a presidential run in the future is my guess. Um, I, I Some people are talking about him taking over in 2020. I don't think that's happening. But I don't know, man. I'm just saying Biden ain't looking good. <laughs> no, no. You're right about that. But it doesn't matter. They're all in. Uh, they're all in on Biden. Yeah. The only person that's going to take Biden's place um, is going to be Hillary, Hillary. Clinton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I still got my fingers crossed for that one because that'll be so entertaining. All right. Uh, <laughs> to you know, this time get to cover uh, a Clinton Trump um, campaign. That'll be oh man. Yeah. Good. Good times. Um, but so at the beginning of this and. I will say that, you know, we didn't understand a whole lot of things about transmission. Like, I mean, even less than we do now yeah. uh, about transmission and so forth. So he's not entirely at fault. However, um, at the beginning of this, uh, Cuomo did make an executive order from the Department of Health in New York um, to that required nursing homes to accept patients that were uh, recovering or had had oh, the virus. Yeah, he did do that. Right. Um, so... Remember that. Uh, then, and also, like a huge percentage of the um, of the nursing uh, of the deaths are nursing home deaths. Oh yeah, well that's um, what I was fixing to say. Is that's what I've read is like I mean this thing is just ravaging nur nursing homes. Yeah, and a huge percentage of the deaths in the U.S. are in the the I think it's a dozen states that essentially adopted the same policy of requiring nursing homes to or actually housing the sick in nursing homes. Yeah. Um, oh man. And so, and a similar thing happened in the UK. Uh, the UK cleared out their hospitals in anticipation of the COVID cases. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, like, or maybe I should say potentially, because you know how much study has been done of this. But yeah. um, we'll say potentially seeding nursing homes with the virus, like sending people out of the yeah. hospitals into the nursing and homes. Just, I mean, granted, we didn't know everything we know, know now. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But just on its face, that just seems like such a bad idea. Like just the whole idea of loading up nursing homes because you, I mean, you had to know that that's where, that's going to be the most affected people by this. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it just seems like such a you bad idea. You didn't have idea. to know that. You um, didn't have to know and, that. But it seemed like it just, it, I mean, common sense just seems to 
dictate that to me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and if you if you put on your like nefarious hat, yeah. you, you could start thinking, well, you know, uh, particularly in places like the UK with the the National Health Service, um, yeah. the old people are a real strain on the system. Yeah. Well, and that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I don't think that that was the case. I don't think oh, um, anybody was like intentionally, was intentionally trying to kill off the old people, but yeah. uh, but that's been the result. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't help the fact that that's what happened. Um, and then moving on with this, I did... Uh, okay, maybe I should start with the CDC stuff. Um, so early this week, I think it was Tuesday, uh, you know, CDC does weekly updates. Um, they released a new report... Uh, it included five different scenarios for the future of the coronavirus um, in the U.S. Um, the first four scenarios were uh, kind of playing around with a couple of pieces, a, a couple of the variables. Yeah. Um, so max min and see what the results would be. Um, the fifth scenario, though, was based on the best data that we have at this time um, for the coronavirus. Yeah. In terms of infection rates and so forth, um, and actually they included uh, the um, idea. I think that they were kind of generous to the coronavirus here um, because they included the idea that asymptomatic people could transfer the virus at the same rate as symptomatic people, yeah. which doesn't seem to be the case. Like super spreaders. Yeah, um, but there's new data coming out saying that that's, that's not, not that's not the case. That's not yeah. the case. Yeah. But they there are no super spreaders. They granted the asymptomatic patients the same like 100% uh, transmissibility of symptomatic patients in their model. Yeah. All right? Um, and so based on the best information that we have at this time, the CDC uh, was estimating a fatality rate among symptomatic patients of four in a thousand. <laughs> so uh, for every thousand people that has symptoms of the virus, four people die. That's a mortality rate of 0.4%. Of uh, symptomatic patients. Now, they also estimated that uh, roughly 35% of people with the virus never develop any symptoms. So, if you factor that in, then the fatality rate, um, or what they, the IFR is what they call it, the infection fatality rate, yeah. is 0.26, wow. which is more than an order of magnitude less than what they've been claiming all along. Oh, yeah. Um, which they've been claiming somewhere between 3 and 4%, I think, uh, yeah. mortality rates. Um, but yeah, uh, from the best information we have at this time, the CDC estimates the fatality rate to actually be about 0.26%. Wow. Now I understand that if you're among those people that's affected by that, that's yeah, that, like horrible. all losses are awful, right? Like oh, we don't absolutely. want people to die, but I would suspect that the fatality rate of, um, uh, bankruptcy or unemployment or whatever is probably higher than that. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm sitting here thinking right now. Um, so I don't know. Uh, and then I, I watched this really interesting interview. So we're all familiar with the, um, was it Neil Ferguson, Ferguson, uh, model that, that it's the one that oh, estimated the one that, yeah, yeah that blew like it up. 2.2 yeah. million people in the U S would die from this virus. Yeah. Um, that is, I would say at this point we can probably safely say is clearly wrong. Yeah. Um, now there was a competing model that came out around the same time. Um, and, uh, is a Dr. Gupta. I can't remember her first name. Uh, anyway, I watched an interview with her, um, earlier this week yeah. and it was really interesting, um, because all she did was, uh, apply, um, a simple standard epidemiological model to, um, her estimates to, to create her estimates. Yeah. Um, which is the, uh, the SIR epidemiological model. It essentially looks at, um, the susceptibility of a population, um, the infections within the population and the recovered, uh, people that have recovered to, um, to model out how the virus will spread. Yeah. And, um, she was saying that based on, uh, based on the data that we have now, now, looking across nations, various um, uh, quarantining or um, isolation uh, protocols, um, you know, varying everywhere from no protocols at all to strict lockdowns, um, that that SIR model uh, most closely fits the results of what we've seen. And that what she was suggesting is that the 
that almost everywhere um, the virus has come and gone, essentially, that it's yeah. on its way out, yeah. that we've seen the worst of it, and now a bulk of the population, enough of the population um, has immunity, has immunity and uh, so we've reached that kind of herd immunity, and yeah. that the lockdown protocols didn't have any impact on the spread of the virus. Yeah, I mean, just anecdotally looking at it, I would agree with with at least that end of it, that mm-hmm. the lockdowns just didn't help. Yeah. Well, and you remember when um, states like Georgia and Florida were opening up and uh, they were saying, oh, no, now we're going to see the second wave. Yeah. We yeah, haven't. Haven't. Hasn't. Yeah. And I still hear even now um, people rumbling about a second wave and this, that, and that, especially like we were talking at the front of the podcast about Gulf Shores just being a madhouse right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if all of the social distancing and stuff was helped so much, I mean, we should be in serious trouble a couple of weeks from now. Um, I just, I don't see it though. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Yeah. Um, and then finally, let's just do one more topic and then we'll, we'll close things out. Sure. Uh, because this is mostly, this is just kind of entertaining to me. Um, but it does raise some questions that I think are worth examining in terms of politics. Uh, and that is the, um, um, the, the whole Trump tweet fiasco. Oh, right. were they, were they, uh, fact checked his tweet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so remember Trump has been tweeting all kinds of crap for years. Yeah. Many yeah, years. Yeah. And they finally flagged a tweet. Yeah. Um, I'm, I can't believe this is the first time they've done that. Yeah. Um, they flagged it as a potentially misleading or something like that. I can't remember exactly what they the way it was something it was along read. those lines. Though, um, yeah. And then it has a, like a little link that you can click for more information. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you went to see what the more information was. I, I haven't. All right. The more information was um, that this uh, tweet contains um, potentially misleading uh, information. I, I can't remember exactly how it said it. it is something along those lines though, but you know, potentially misleading informa- uh, information, um, according to CNN and the Washington post. <laughs> because those are our standard bears. <laughs> right. Um, and of course it didn't provide you anything more than that. It's not like it linked to any studies or any kind of hard data. It was based on these news organizations feelings, apparently, <laughs> um, that this could be potentially misleading. Um, and in response, Trump threatens to shut down social media. Um, then they've brought up the question once again, or are they a platform or a publisher? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, for those that want to get into the nitty gritty, uh, section two thirty of the communications decency act, um, protects, uh, platforms from being liable for, um, information that is presented by users on their website. So, uh, essentially, um, things like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, if all they're doing is hosting, um, information provided by users, then they can't be held liable for anything that those users post. Yeah. Which the users still can be. Oh yeah. Well, and <laughs> as they should be, but the platform can't. Yeah. And so it, it's, it defines, a difference between a, um, a, uh, just a platform, a media platform and a publisher, um, essentially being editorializing. Yeah. So the question is at what point are you editorializing? I mean, I would say absolutely at this point for them and for Facebook. Yeah. Um, because I see those little snippets on Facebook all the time. Yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of them on my post. (laughs) Well, I mean, there's uh, certainly some picking and choosing going on. Now, Trump says that, you know, they're always silencing uh, conservative voices. Uh, that's not the case um, from what I've seen. Yeah. It is mostly conservative voices, um, but it's mostly conservative voices that are dissidents. Dissidents on the left are being silenced too, though. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's not really about whether you're right or left. It's whether you're buying into the mainstream narrative or not. Yeah. Um, if you're opposing the mainstream narrative, whether from the left or the right, or the government, well, one and the same. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, but if you're oppo- if you're opposing the mainstream narrative from either the left or the right or any other direction, yeah. that's what's getting silenced. It just happens to be mostly right wingers that are opposing that the narrative. That. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's I think it's a question worth considering. Like, at what point are they editorializing? Um, it. I think that the uh, the fact that they are 
you know, that there's this appeal to authority all the time about, you know, particularly like the coronavirus stuff, or if you, uh, as another example, which is, I think is very similar in a lot of ways, the um, uh, global warming stuff, or, you know, anthropogenic global climate change, whatever the <laughs> Whatever term we're is. calling it this week. Yeah. Um, that, uh, okay, well, the scientists say, the scientists say, the scientists say, but then YouTube and, and other platforms are um, silencing uh, MDs, like legitimate MDs that are opposing the mainstream narrative about coronavirus. Yeah. Um, well, how come you're appealing to the uh, credentials of the one guy that agrees with you, but you're silencing the guy with the same credentials that doesn't? Exactly. That starts to seem like editorializing to oh, me. Oh, without question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, but the other, the other thing that I think is interesting about it is that when they finally decided to, um, say something about one of Donald Trump's posts, it's when he was talking about, uh, ma uh, mail-in ballots being rife for fraud. Yeah. Why yeah. is it that this is the issue yeah. that finally s makes them decide to, to so, flag one of his posts. Why is it mail-in ballots? Yeah. Why is it related to the election, the upcoming election? And uh, the idea that that would benefit the Democrats, that that's finally the thing that they're like, well, you know, we can't we're let gonna, them get away with we're this. We're going to dig in here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's a question worth asking. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I don't know if there's any kind of conspiracy. I'm not even suggesting necessarily that it, there is, but... It's a question it, it worth asking. It doesn't seem like it's an accident. Yeah. I'll say that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I was telling you a couple of weeks ago, there's no good place to, like, drop this into the, the narrative that we're creating here. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I was telling you a couple of weeks ago that I saw somebody, I think it was on, I think it was on France 24, um, and uh, he just, some commentator, um, who was saying that... Uh, that, you know, the evidence seems to be that um, any future president is going to be m most likely another George W. Bush or a Donald Trump, that um, that Barack Obama was an oddity looking at the future, that, you know, any future presidents will be more like these two guys. And that I thought that, that was really strange because um, really it seems to me what he's identifying is that uh, it looks like future presidents are going to be Republican, not <laughs> Democrat, because if you put those three people together and told me to group two of them, I would have put Bush and Obama together. I yeah. think Trump's the standout. That's the, oh. the weirdo in that group. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> um, yeah. I mean, Obama and Bush have way more in common than Trump and any mix of the rest. Yeah. Like, I mean... He, he's definitely, you're right about that. Yeah, yeah. he's the outsider. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, so, I, I don't know. I just thought that that was odd and, and kind of funny. And actually, like, okay, so here's a good place to end. Um, we can we can plug our own narrative as we, right. as we go out today. Um, so, for a long time, you've essentially gotten eight years of Republican, eight years of Democrat, eight years of Republican, eight years of Democrat. So, and it seems to be that the rationale is that a majority of voters are independent in the, yeah. in the country. I think that that's changing a little bit. Like there's definitely more there seems partisanship, to be more, but yeah, people backing into picking the corner and sticking in it. Yeah. But I still think that most voters in this country are independent. And, uh, it seems to me that what's happening is that they're like, ah, oh, well, the Democrats didn't get get us in a place that we want to be. So let's try the Republicans. Well, he's only had four years. Let's give him another four years. See what he can do. Yeah. Okay. The Republicans didn't get us there. Let's get a Democrat in office. Yeah. Well, he's only had four years. Let's give him another four years and see what he could do. Yeah. Well, the Democrats didn't get us there. Let's try a Republican. And we've been doing this over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, and what I would say is that if you're not getting what you want, out of the Republicans or the Democrats. And it seems clear to me that people are dissatisfied with the status quo in general, and that's how we got Obama and then Trump. Both of yeah. those guys were outsiders uh, in terms of political establishment when they were elected. Yeah. Um, so, But you're still not getting what you want, are you, out of the Republicans or the Democrats? Maybe, just maybe, it's time to, time to try someone from a different party. Yeah. yeah. And the Libertarian Party has a good candidate this year, Joe Jorgensen. Check her out. Um, yeah. It may be time that if you really want something to change, if you're not satisfied with where we're going and you actually want something to change, that you pick something completely different. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Just a thought. Yep. Um, and uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll, 
we'll truck on out of here, I suppose. Um, and uh, as always, uh, follow us on Facebook and I think, no, Facebook and, I don't know, follow us where you can follow us, uh, subscribe where you can subscribe, uh, like and share, it certainly helps us out a lot if you if you pass along the message, and um, we'll be back in about a week, uh, is the plan. <laughs> I think in Thursdays. Yeah, um, we're, we're going to try and get back to Thursdays, and uh, so we'll be back in about a week, in the meantime, try and stay free. Life's short, live free. <laughs> Ciao. Later.